Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Dubai Science Park stand here in Arab Health and uh, Advanced Health session for, for the second day. Today, we are uh, going to be speaking about movement, do surgeries, and, and take uh, more serious measures, uh, and the relationship between all of that. Um, so we have a, a great panel today um, that will be, you know, discussing that topic in, a, uh, in great details. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and maybe say a few words about what you do and your company. So we'll start with Dr. Ryan. Fantastic. And, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, we are a, a Canadian company. We've been here for about four days now and we're falling in love with Dubai. Um, so just an incredible place, and it's an honor to be here on the panel with all of you. Uh, so Kinetosense is a 3D markerless motion capture technology where we use the 3D sensors in our everyday technology. So in our iPhones, our iPads, we have 3D sensors now that we can actually look at analyzing human biomechanics in three dimensions, because humans move in three dimensions. And we can then apply some of that data and look at population norms and uh, be able to actually clinically triage that patient. So I'm very excited to speak on, on our solution and, uh, and, and uh, also integrate that into the panel discussion. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, my name is Kevin Tashir. I'm the managing director of a gym chain called The Warehouse Gym. Uh, we are a locally uh, founded uh, gym chain. Uh, we have 11 locations throughout Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Uh, and we've got more uh, gyms in the pipeline. Um, we position ourselves as, a, as more of a lifestyle. Uh, it's not just uh, exercise, but we look at it more as a holistic as well, a uh, lifestyle. Uh, and we're looking more and more uh, into recovery and how uh, other aspects of uh, lifestyle effects uh, and it improves exercise. So uh, glad to be here today and uh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, all I do is spine, but in conjunction with two other orthopedic surgeons, we've formed OrthoPro at Dubai Science Park. So we cover the spectrum of orthopedic pathology. We like to think of ourselves as an ethical uh, but technically competent um, healthcare provider. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to be given the opportunity to talk amongst this uh, distinguished panel. Great. Let me start with you, Dr. Sharif. And instead of asking Kevin well, how exercise is good for the spine, let me ask you, how does exercise prevent spinal issues? Uh, well, it does so in a number of ways, and perhaps the most important way, two, two, two most important things that come to mind, actually. One is that when you exercise, you build up your muscles, you build up, you know, what you've all heard of your core. That, that means the, the muscles of the abdominal wall, the muscles immediately adjacent to the spine. That's what we're talking about when we say core, as well as the muscles on the back of the spine. When you build up those muscles, you are stabilizing the spine. You're offloading the discs, you're offloading the facet joints, the small little joints in the spine, and that helps to prevent problems. Um, the second really most important thing, and, and what a lot of people may not be aware of, is that in the adult, the disc does not have a blood supply. All right, so you have a vertebra, disc, vertebra, and that disc is an island with no blood reaching it. It relies on diffusion from the vertebra into the disc of oxygen, nutrients, and so on, and it relies on diffusion of waste products from the disc into the bone. And so exercise, movement, helps that process of diffusion across the bone into the disc. That's probably the most important reason for exercise, is keeping that disc nicely Right. So pressure on the disc is not necessarily a bad thing? So day-to-day -day activity is not a bad thing, correct? Okay. It's important. If right. you don't exercise at all, if you have a, a very sedentary lifestyle, then actually your disc isn't getting the nourishment that it needs. It isn't getting that stimulation. It isn't being cleansed of those waste products. Right, right. And how is it so that, uh, and this is a discussion I, I hear on a, probably on a weekly basis, that some people have disc issues and are able to live with it and you know do certain things and movement however others need to do a surgery so where do you draw the line um very good question i mean if we were to look at this room i'm gonna guess the average age is 35 
And if I were to stick 135-year-olds into an MRI scanner, 30% of them would have evidence of degenerative disc disease. Now, that's meaningless, all right? Um, just because you have an MRI scan that shows your disc is degenerate doesn't mean that you need surgery. Surgery is excellent for those patients who have a disc prolapse, where the disc is out and it's pushing on a nerve and it's not going away. So ordinarily, when the disc prolapses, presses on a nerve, nasty shooting pain down the leg, that's called sciatica. What happens is the body throws white cells at that prolapse. They eat away the prolapse. The nerve becomes free, sciatica goes, without any surgical intervention. Surgery, though, is very useful for those where it's not going away or where the nerve compression is so bad that they have weakness or they have bladder or bowel dysfunction. Then surgery is a must. And surgery has a very high patient satisfaction in that scenario. Surgery for back pain is a completely different story. You know, we'll, we'll come back to, to, okay. to that in, in a little bit later. Um, Kevin, if I look at, obviously, lots of benefits for exercise, right, from feeling good, etc. But I'm sure that you have also customers who have back issues or there to, you know, to correct their posture. So how does the warehouse gym, um, you know, work with those kind of uh, customers? Yeah. I mean, it, what, what, what's important to point out, as the doctor said about, you know, there's lots of, you know, great benefits uh, with exercise, you know. And I'm here representing, obviously, exercise component. Um, and I think like what the doctor said, I mean, there are all the benefits uh, of movement, of activity. Uh, I probably would like to also mention one thing that's also activity in, in the gym is, has an important part, is, uh, is making sure people maintain a healthy weight as well. As obviously, you know, when people are, we see a lot of people that are overweight tend to have these problems with back issues and uh, etc. But yeah, I mean, What's really interesting right now is that the gym is becoming more than just exercise. It's not just about, okay, losing weight or putting muscle on. The gym is becoming a, a very much a lifestyle, and it's also becoming a sport within itself. Uh, you see a lot of these activities, uh, such as CrossFit, uh, there's high rocks, powerlifting, weightlifting. Uh, there's, you know, the, the gym is becoming a, a, a place of where people are really pushing themselves, um, the you know the uh, very motivated, uh, but what comes with that is people at risk as well. I mean, a lot of people are we, we, we do see it in the gym, and you probably see it when you when, when you're in the gym yourself that people are constantly trying to get better, get stronger, push it. Like I said, it's not just necessarily a, a personal, but it's also quite competitive as. Well. So I think as, as a gym, and our responsibility is just to make sure people are training correctly, uh, training safely. Um, right. It is a challenge, you know, when you've got a handful of staff and you've got thousands of members. Um, I mean, what is, a, what is good actually, though, is that the customers today are, are very much educated compared to what they were many years ago. So I sometimes look at the gym floor and I see people, the way they train and exercise, and I'm like, wow, they really know how to, you know, the technique is on point, they know how to program. But still, there's still that element there where people are pushing themselves and there is risk. So, you know, with our staff, uh, we always make sure that, you know, our staff are not just qualified, but highly experienced, practicing some of these disciplines that, you know, our, our members are also training and, and, and take some responsibility there to make sure that we are keeping an eye on the gym floor, we are watching people, they are training correctly. And if we do see a, you know, someone performing a move, you know, incorrectly, you know, encourage our staff to approach them in a nice way, you know, suggest about doing this, try it this way, um, but yeah. And in terms of, you know, what happened during the, the pandemic and lots of gyms were, you know, had to close down and then the, the ramp up was kind of slow. And at that time, I think a lot of people opted for training at home or using technology. So are, are you someone who supports the use of technology when it comes to training or you're all about come to the gym do your thing well look i, I can i'm split um i mean exercise is it's very primal in its you know its raw essence you know it's physical movement uh, but technology can assist that massively um obviously with uh wearables 
uh, for accountability, uh, measurement, because exercise is important to measure. Um, so, and, and also, you know, there's, there's technologies now that are also looking at people's movement with AI and especially with uh, the mobile phones that we will see a lot more in the future is that uh, your mobile phone will be able to give you real life feedback on you know your correction uh, any adjustments that need to be made so definitely technology is a way forward it'll be a great uh, be very useful in preventing in injury uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish in the fact when you said about the, the presence gym and, uh, and and being at home you know the gym is very much community driven and there's that aspect there so having that psychology and that community feel is is really what makes uh, yeah what, what what makes it real benefit of coming into the gym versus uh, yeah. working out from home. Yeah, I agree. I think the community factor is what brings people together, even even uh, the, you know, the apps that you have out there who are just focused on uh, personal uh, improvement tends to fade out with time and it doesn't really give you that motive to continue. So um, the, the community factor, I think, is, is very important. Yeah. And and I think with some, the, with some of the technology and some of the, it's just uh, the reliability of them as well. Um, I know a lot of people, we see a lot of, you know, customers that are very focused on, for example, a calorie burn. Um, you know, there, there, there is going to be some variance in different, you know, different uh, wearables. Again, the accuracy of them is not 100% right now. So, you know, it, it, it's very important to not just be so objective and look at that number i think you have to be very self-aware yourself yeah. and use it as a guide and just be aware that you know technology um still right in that space is still not 100 percent accurate so you use it as a guide and use it as a as a tool great thank you dr ryan if i look at the the ecosystem of performance and rehabilitation what are the gaps that you have identified yeah, that's a that's a really important question, and and um, you know one of the things that that I look when I when I look at performance and rehabilitation, we have you know experts on 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 both sides here. With Kevin being you know performance a performance expert, we have Doc here that is into you know surgery and real rehabilitation. The really important thing to understand is that it's on the same continuum. So when we look at the continuum of where we stand functionally, we're either moving to better function and better performance and moving away from injury and potential injury or moving the other way. And I think that that's a really important concept when we're talking about an ecosystem because that's what's happening now in healthcare and, and in performance is that we have the trainers now working with the, the therapists and vice versa. There's, there's this ecosystem of multidisciplinary care that's starting to happen now. And, and we need to find out where that person sits on that continuum. That's the biggest gap that we see right now. So where, where do we stand? Where do we each stand today on this continuum of functional performance and, and, and preventing risk of injury, preventing sciatica? Because we're able to hinge from our hip and we have mobility in our hip to do so and we're not using our low back to flex and putting our, 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 our discs at risk. And obviously there's a lot more factors involved in that. I'm very much simplifying it. Um, but looking at, at those components and then being able to compare functional movement that's three-dimensional, being able to screen any one of you through a functional movement screen on a 3D device and tell you where you stand in comparison to the population, to someone that's your age, your gender, your body type, your lever lengths, your length of femur, these different components, and then being able to give those experts, we call it expert augmentation, the ability to look at, okay, this is where you stand, this is where we need to move you, and now here's going to be the protocols that we're gonna train you with to get you to reach those goals. So really a compass in care, and I think that truly that has been the biggest missing piece is that we, it's all been very subjective in nature. Right. And we have to start right. to use objective analysis tools, augment. That's really the key. So the assessment that you do is through the mobile phone? Fantastic. So uh, who here has a, an Apple iPhone? Put your hand up. Who has a Apple iPhone Pro? Put your hand up. So we're starting to see more and more of these devices coming out. And these are 3D sensors 
LIDAR sensors that I can take someone through 12 movements that are evidence-based, like an overhead squat, an inline lunge, um, you name it, 12 different movements. And I, we look at, it's called a reactivity. So if I put someone in an overhead squat, how is their body going to adjust and react to allow for that complex movement to happen? Do they have mobility, primary mobility in all the joints that they need to move in? Or if there's a restriction, let's say in the hip, are they gonna steal that range of motion from the low back? We map that and it takes three minutes to complete. So we believe that this is really where we find that person on that continuum of functional movement that we're gonna see in clinics and we're seeing this around the world, the clinicians are using this. We have orthopedic surgeons that are now using this for pre and post surgery. And, and uh, training facilities. Because if we have that data, we can baseline the individual to find out where they sit in that spectrum. And if an injury does occur, we now know what the baseline is. We can rehabilitate them to that level or past that level again. So it's a very granular way of looking at movement. But again, we've been, movement's always been so quantitative. When we talk about movement's important, you need to move, you need to do lots of movement, which is true. But what about the qualitative aspect? How do we move? That's the key. And some of our, our, our workout warriors, we call them, that, that sometimes overexert, and we see this all the time. We sometimes see this in CrossFit and some of these, some of these groups, incredible workouts. If we, if we shoot past the demand, if the demand shoots past the capacity of, of our body function at any given time, we're now at risk for injury. Right. So... Great. I mean, this assessment, you know, is, is amazing. Now, and, and you said you have data that you compare it to, right? So you know if this is 1 out of 10 or 5 out of 10. And then uh, at which point you decide that he needs to go see an orthopedic surgeon or he needs to go to the gym? That's a great question. So one of the things that we're doing, we have one of the largest biomechanical repositories of data in the world, um, and, and HIPAA-compliant data, of course, that we're applying machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms where we're actually going to create data loops, and from screening someone, we'll be able to say, based on how you move, based on, on your mechanics, based on your age, your gender, 30% of people that have a diagnosis like sciatica do best with an orthopedic referral immediately. 20% do best with a physical therapy referral. 50% do best with a gym, a gym referral, working with one of the experts in the, in the gym facility. So it's called clinical triaging. And we have to have population data to do this, which we have. And number two, we have to have devices that are readily available, commercially readily available, to be able to do these assessments and do them quickly and not need to have these million-dollar Vicon labs that these universities have. Excellent. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Sharif, I know that um, you know, OrthoPro is not only your, your regular orthopedic uh, clinic, but also it has a, a, a very large rehabilitation an exercise facility as well. So is your vision that you, you know, you do as less intervention as possible because you have access to the you know, physical therapy, rehab, etc., and only surgery when it's needed? Yes, uh, we only operate when it's needed. Um, but I, I guess what makes us unique is that we are comprehensive. We can offer all of the non-operative measures as well as the operative measures. Um, so when a patient comes on to see us, invariably they'll be referred to our therapists, we'll take them through the gym routines, and we'll assess their, their mechanics and so on and try and manage them non-operatively. But, but if they do need an operation, then, then hopefully they'll get a good quality surgery to, to get them moving again. Let's go a little bit deeper into back surgeries uh, and spinal surgeries because they're so common. And I know that surgeries are getting better and better with the uses of laser, for example. So what does the future look like? Uh, are we going to be seeing less and less screws or what's... Uh... Uh, well, the, the future is very exciting. I mean, there's a lot of AI and stuff coming into it. It's not here yet, but it's certainly coming. Um, here, it may be in terms of diagnosis and so on, in terms of some of the surgical planning that we do with the various screws and so on. But it's, it's not about to replace us anytime soon. 
Um, the future may involve stem cells. Um, so that's, that's an up and coming thing. You know, today I could take any given person's stem cells, I can culture them in the lab into 100 million cells and I can inject them into that disc. But, but early on I told you about how hostile that environment was. And, and so I can't keep those stem cells alive in that disc just yet. But I think that will come in the future. Um, it'll also come in terms of spinal cord injury, you know, falling off your horse and sustaining a, a severed spinal cord, leaving you paralyzed. Hopefully we'll be able to do something about that with, with uh, stem cells in the future. There's a lot of research going into that. So that's what's really most exciting for yeah, me. Right. Kevin, if we look at the journey of Warehouse Gym, and I've, and I've been a a client for a long time and I've, I've seen the growth uh, but you know maybe in in a few locations I haven't been able to see everything but what do you think has been the secret behind the growth and the success um, you know that we have seen uh, many gyms that have come to the country in the last 10-20 years um, not all of them have been able to you know grow and sustain themselves but if you tell us you know, and, and probably a, a word of advice for, for the uh, people out here. What has been the, the secret sauce, if you will? Um, the secret sauce is probably a bit of an X factor. Um, I think it, it's a combination of multiple, um, multiple elements. I mean, in today's, especially today, the customer, is, when it comes to exercise, is, is very, very knowledgeable. Um, you know, as I mentioned just before, the customer, uh, you know, I, I look on the gym floor and I, I look at the knowledge base of the customer and I, I get blown away. You know, they really do know and they really are pushing the trainers. Uh, exercise is becoming, as I said, it's becoming more than just working out for a, a result. It, it, it's becoming a... a it's becoming a lifestyle. It's becoming a part of your day. And I think what Warehouse Gym uh, is, is one of the reasons it's been successful is that we've embraced that. It's not just about coming in and working out. It's keeping up with the trends. It's keeping under, it's understanding what's happening in the industry and how people are exercising. Uh, but it's also making an, an environment that people want to stay and feel comfortable. And it's like your second, your second home, your second space. Um, so I think we've been, we, 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 we're good at designing spaces and we're designing spaces where people feel comfortable. Uh, and there is, you know, with gyms, there has been challenges where people do feel intimidated to come into a gym. Uh, I think Warehouse Gym is very good at uh, making, creating an atmosphere that, which is very friendly. Uh, it starts with the staff at the front. And also the way we, like I said, where we do our, our gyms, our layouts, uh, make it feel very comfortable. Um, so I think what we've done differently is just to, to really embrace the customer, uh, see what the customer wants. Uh, and that, what, we, what we also do is, um, which is very unique to Warehouse Gym, and this is probably the secret sauce, is that each one of our gyms is very different. We have 11 gyms right now. Each one of those gyms are very different uh, from the way they look, from the layout, from the equipment choices, um, the demographic, uh, the class options. So it allows us to really scale. It allows us to do a lot more. Um, I mean, there is so much you can do in one gym. Uh, so you have to get that balance of, you know, having the services, the equipment that people want, but also creating a space uh, that, is, that is comfortable, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, a bigger gym is better and just keep getting a bigger and bigger gym. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, so you want to have something that is uh, a nice sweet spot. So I think what we've done ultimately is, um, is make gyms that really make people feel at home. And I think that is what the difference is. And then the second part of that is that each, our, each one of our gyms are very different and we have different services and we encourage our customers to use different gyms because, you know, exercise is challenging. Um, it is discomfort at times. People do get bored. So you want to make sure that your your customer, you know, if they, if, if they feel like a different location, a different space, I want to train a bit differently. We have these network of gyms that allow allow for that for them rather going to join a, you know, a different gym. Yeah, excellent, great. Um, Ryan, who, so tell us a little bit about 
who your customer is. Is it a clinic? Is it a is it gyms? Is it people out there? Testing. That's a great question. Um, so, so we started uh, we started this journey about ten years ago, and um, I'm a clinician myself. And and just quickly, in my undergrad, I worked in a Vicon lab. So this, these are these amazing labs, or million dollar labs that the universities have access to, and some very high level hospitals do too. But it's just the the technology is incredible. We get three dimensional data, but it's not available to everyone. And then fast forward into my studies, realizing the practitioners that are in the MSK space, the musculoskeletal space, we have very little tools to analyze functional movement or range of motion. So that's why we started to look at the available 3D technologies. We actually started, it, it, it really started when I was at a friend's house and we were playing on his Xbox Connect camera. Has anyone played on the Xbox before? And I was just like, this is exactly what we need. This is a commercially available 3D sensing camera for gaming that we can apply algorithms and then start to use clinically. So we started clinically. We started selling it to, to, to chiropractors, physio, physical therapists. Uh, and then we started getting into the functional movement piece because, again, functional movement is, is if you take range of motion and you do some more complex movements, you, you start to analyze functional movement. And that naturally progressed us into the fitness space and into the human performance space. So now we have gyms using it. We have professional sports teams. Uh, we actually just built a risk of Achilles tendon rupture screen with Manchester United Soccer or football. I should say football. We call it soccer in Canada. Uh, and um, so we're, we're starting to progress and we're, we are seeing this, this continuum that we never thought existed. We thought that healthcare and performance was very siloed. And, and it's not. And so I think that the, the, the uptake of our technology in these different sectors shows how much it's really becoming multidisciplinary. And, um, and it's really about the client journey, the patient journey, and, and it takes a therapist, it takes a surgeon, and it takes uh, you know, a, a training specialist to be part of that journey. Thank you very much. I, I truly enjoyed it, and I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you.